Ready. Yeah. Ready. Your Excellency Alexandra Sduku, Deputy Minister of Environment and Energy, Greece, esteemed speakers on the panel and esteemed dignitaries of the dais, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the post-lunch session on planting the seeds of low carbon growth. My name is Sam, I'm from India. I'm co-founder of India, Singapore and London-based Midcat Advisory. Oh. It's an AI startup. So big thank you to Dr. Frank Richter, Indo-Hellenic Chamber of Commerce, and everyone else involved in putting together this wonderful Horasis India 2024 in this beautiful ancient city, the cradle of civilization. So we are indeed honored with the warmth and hospitality we have been accorded here for the last couple of days. So indeed grateful to the people of Athens and to the government of Greece. for. So we had a fascinating conversation yesterday and today. And as you would have all noticed, one theme picked up, came up again and again, you know, sustainable development, low carbon growth, Greece as the LNG, energy and electricity gateway to Europe, massive energy investments, including in renewable energy, the energy corridors, the great progress made by Europe, uh, the energy union and Greece in, in environmental protection and sustainable development. And we in India definitely have lots to learn from Greece on, the, on that account. India has been a founding member of International Solar Alliance, and Greece is also a member, a very, very valuable member of the alliance founded by India. So we are indeed privileged to be joined on the dais by Her Excellency Alexandra, Deputy Minister of Environment and Energy, speakers on the panel in no particular order, uh, Nobumitsu Akai. Ah, yes. He is the founder and CEO, uh, he is the director, JFR Group Japan. So Akai-san, thank you, so privileged I... to have you on the... Okay, yeah. thank you. So thank you very much. I'm very much honored uh, giving this uh, opportunities. So I'm from Japan, uh, based in a, a technological based company um, in terms of biotechnology <coughs> and also uh, some environmental uh, technologies. So I have uh, experience working with uh, university in Greece. It is a Thessaloniki University. Uh, we had a, uh, such a long term uh, relationship with Thessaloniki in uh, swine industry, but it is a little bit a restriction in India. So today I'm going to touch a little bit about the dairy uh, industry. And uh, uh, I'm also having an uh, experience working with uh, Indian companies. And uh, India is uh, one very uh, popular place for Japanese pharmaceutical companies or OEM. So I think I'm going to touch something about uh, Greece and uh, uh, India uh, synergy. Uh, so we'll welcome so thank to you, you, sir. Thank yeah, you, thank, thank you. Thank you for the. Uh, on my left is Professor Dr. Fobe Kunduri. So, ma'am, uh, please announce me with. The, please excuse me for the pronunciations for the, all the mistakes. The pronunciation is absolutely perfect. Yeah. Do you want me to say something, or we move? We will quickly introduce. So, so she is the chair, United Nations SDSN Global, Global Climate Hub of Greece. And on the left, we have Bernard. Bauhofer is the founder and CEO of Sparring Partners Switzerland. So, ladies and gentlemen, warm welcome. We have a very diverse and incredibly talented people of having representations from the government, private sector, various countries, various continents. So, as we all know, India and Greece are both rapidly growing economies, uh, different economic pathways, but both hugely committed to sustainable development. It has been reiterated again and again. India is the fifth largest economy, country of 1.4 billion people, still a poor country. So we will be very, very important in the fight against climate change. Greece aims to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 54% by 2030 and achieve net zero by 2050, 20 years ahead of India. So we have much to learn from you. On this panel, among other things, we will look at the progress made by the European Union and Greece in transitioning to low carbon economy the key achievements of the energy union, uh, challenges faced and opportunities that lie ahead. And we will look up to you for guidance on many of these themes. We will look at the emerging technologies and what are their transformative potential. We will look at what partnerships are needed, whether it is multilateral institutions like World Bank or government to government partnerships or government to EU partnerships or, or public private or even corporate startups, B2B, SME to SME. So all kinds of partnerships will look at 
sector specific innovations the socio economic aspects of green transition and the importance of a just transition because the people who are impacted the most are those at the bottom of the pyramid when such a trans major transition happens finally what synergies do india and greece have for mutual benefit i mean it could be using greece and cyprus as the springboard for indian companies to with indian companies indian ideas indian people uh, indian green ideas green goods concepts into the eu we could look at uh, you know business to business connects we could look at sustainable green economy blue economy circular economy uh, there would be other colors that i'm missing out promotion of biodiversity resilient supply chains uh, there is you would have talked about you would have heard about the ambassador spoke about it this morning about the india middle east europe economic corridor we we have a great opportunity to make it a green corridor of prosperity not only ports but also scz renewable energy data centers all powered by green energy we, we have to look at financing we have to look at encouraging sustainable sustainable energy consumption patterns we have to educate the people we have to see if people are ready to pay for the green goods and and green skills and then of course jobs impacts etc so this is how i intend to progress the discussion we will first have the opening remarks of 7 to 8 minutes by her excellency and then each of the panelists get about 4 minutes for their opening comments and then we will take few questions we will also take questions from the audience and at the end we'll request everyone to sum up so i hope Great. that is fine so let me first call upon you your excellency uh, just a brief bio about yourself i mean you are you have a law degree from democritus university of thrace you served as a legal consultant I, i'm a lawyer actually but uh, after 17 years uh, of working at the ministry of energy and environment nobody understands that uh, my background is uh, is is legal uh, as i'm uh, talking every day about um, photovoltaic or uh, yeah. wind or battery storage or uh, geothermal uh, i don't know <coughs> um now i think we are entering uh, into the hardcore of uh, which is besides the topic of uh, our today's discussion climate change energy and environment all of them are very well linked and interconnected and obviously it it wasn't used to be you know uh, an issue a few years ago but now i think it's a hot topic very high on the agenda of every government i would say every nation um and absolutely we have a lot of challenges ahead of us so i mean we will i will mean, we'll look at you i mean we we'll request you to deliver your opening remarks i want you to cover at least the key achievements of the energy union okay. all the progress being made by europe i mean you rep- you are the okay. best rep- to represent european union here yeah, i mean you have multiple hats so you will have to represent greece also what are the challenges faced what progress has been made by greece in in transitioning to clean and green energy and what are the opportunities for collaboration between india and greece a so, lot of questions <laughs> stage is all yours <laughs> thank you sam thank you very much uh you are a perfect moderator uh, mm-hmm. let me say hello to our panelists uh, let me say uh, good evening to to all of you in this room those who still have the energy i suppose uh, uh, to be here let me say a warm thank to the organizers horaces and uh, hellenic indian uh, chambers um, uh, all of you uh, for me it's uh, it's a true honor to be here today I I received a lot of questions uh, from uh, from Sam but um, Sam I think since um, the title what's the title the title of the panel is uh, planting the seeds of uh, low carbon uh, growth right um, I believe that we have um, already planted most of these seeds uh, and um, I would dare to say not just uh, one type uh we've got many different ones since we are talking about um energy and climate i would say we have uh, planted uh, wind uh, solar uh, hydrogen uh, uh, other clean tech technologies um but now i think the real task is uh, making sure that uh, they grow strong uh they become mature they become uh, commercially viable um and they deliver i would say the um, uh, the benefits to everyone so this is i think uh, the target that we the goal that we should all uh, have 
Uh, that's the challenge ahead. And I think that's the analogy we are aiming for. Someone might also ask, um, what could um, a small country like uh, Greece possibly have in common with uh, a massive economy like India? Uh, but I strongly believe that despite uh, our differences uh, in size uh, and uh, economic scale, um, I would say that both Greece and uh, uh, India, they are strongly committed to decarbonizing uh, our nations, phasing out fossil fuels. I know it's a difficult task also for, for your country. Um, just to tell you that Greece has uh, set uh, a bold target uh, to phase out fossil fuels, um, which is lignite. This is the main uh, fossil fuel in Greece, completed uh, uh, to phase out by 2028. Uh, so that's the target. Um, if you were asking me 10 years ago, uh, what was the percentage? Uh, our main fossil fuel for our electricity production, uh, which was lignite, it was 45% 10 years ago. In 2023, uh, we managed to drop it uh, to 9% uh, on our uh, energy mix. And uh, by 2024, uh, we have dropped it one more percentage. So now it's um, 80%, uh, 8, yes, percent. Uh, with a target of phasing it completely out uh, by 2028. Um, India, of course, despite its huge energy uh, needs, uh, I think is also uh, on a strong path towards decarbonization. Coal, I think, now accounts for less than um, uh, 50% of India's uh, power generation. Uh, renewable energy made up... Uh, uh, I googled them and I saw that you are around 71% uh, 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 of uh, new uh, capacity, power capacity added. And um, with this brief introduction, I would like to um, say a few words on, on what you have asked me. Actually, four key points, I will be very brief. First topic is, uh, as you mentioned, key achievements. Uh, of the energy union and in the European Union. Second topic is uh, what are the, the challenges we're facing in this green transition. The third topic is how Greece is progressing. Uh, and the fourth and final is um, what I really like, collaboration opportunities uh, between uh, European Union, Greece and uh, India. Starting with the first topic, um, let me list in headlines um, a few key achievements uh, that, in my view, showcase the European Union's progress uh, towards the green transition. Uh, so let's start with the good news first. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, talking about greenhouse gas uh, uh, reductions. Um, as we know, or we don't know, since uh, 1990, European Union has cut, Phoebe knows, I think, better than me, its uh, emissions by almost 33 uh, percent. And at the end, of course, while, I would say not end, at the same time our economy has grown um, by 67 uh, percent. And I think this is already by itself a major um, uh, achievement, uh, showing what? Uh, that we can grow economically uh, while cutting emissions. Um, to give another figure, in 2023 alone, emissions from power generation in, uh, in Europe, it fell by 15.5%, uh, uh, which is, I think, another significant uh, success. Second, energy prices. Um, uh, here I would make the comment that still uh, the energy prices are not exactly at the level where uh, we would like them to be. We still suffer from high uh, energy prices. Um, about uh, Greece here, I open a parenthesis to say that uh, although the wholesale electricity prices are still in Greece at a higher level than the European one, uh, especially compared to other central uh, European countries, because there are external factors, because there are distortions um, 
uh, in other uh, regional countries which are interconnected uh, with Greece, uh, but still the retail prices uh, for final consumers, uh, they are lower, uh, let's say, significantly uh, than other European countries that have larger uh, economies. Um, now, the third about uh, renewable energy growth. Uh, what is happening in Europe is that wind energy has uh, seen um, high growth, um, overtaking, I would say, gas uh, as the European Union's second largest electricity source. Uh, our, so we have today a total wind capacity uh, of uh, 221 gigawatts uh, with uh, another 16 gigawatts that, are, uh, that were installed in uh, 2023. And solar, solar as well, it continues to break uh, installation uh, records. Uh, just in 2023, I think we set another record by adding uh, 56 uh, gigawatts of new solar capacity. Um, so uh, I think it's more than obvious to uh, emphasize on the importance of the renewables uh, in our electricity uh, system, which uh, uh, I think decreased, thanks to them, the, the bills of final consumers during the energy prices. It decreased it around, if I remember well, 3.5 uh, billion euros uh, during the crisis uh, because the low levelized uh, cost of energy. The fourth point I would like to say is that turning to clean uh, technology in uh, 2024, uh, we introduced within the European Union, the Net Zero Industry Act, uh, and also the Critical Raw Materials Act, which is, I think, also very important. So these initiatives, um, what they aim, they aim at strengthening Europe's supply chains, um, and of course, they aim at boosting um, clean technology manufacturing. Uh, fifth, we also have in Europe, um, we launched the European Hydrogen Bank. Uh, this is um, something new, actually. I think now all countries try to, to understand uh, what are the opportunities in the hydrogen sector and uh, what projects can be materialized. But um, uh, speaking more tangibly, uh, Europe managed in its first uh, auction round, it awarded nearly 720 million uh, to seven renewable hydrogen projects uh, across Europe, and I think that's a good uh, beginning. Uh, about grids, grid connections, which is uh, also something very important because only with grids we will be able to enable the green transition. What do we have uh, within Europe? We have a grids action plan, uh, which is um, a major step forward in um, addressing uh, the challenges around uh, expanding, uh, modernizing, uh, and digitalizing uh, Europe's uh, electricity networks. Um, uh, as a seventh, seventh point, uh, let me also highlight our ongoing efforts um, in supporting Ukraine. Uh, uh, let's remember that the European Union has uh, provided over 500 uh, million uh, in, uh, in energy equipment uh, for Ukraine uh, generators, transformers, in order to support Ukraine's uh, energy sector. Uh, and um, last, I uh, would also like to mention uh, our role as a European Union in um, international energy and uh, climate diplomacy, uh, which has been crucial. Um, uh, we remember at COP28, uh, the European Union uh, has led uh, this global effort to triple uh, renewable energy capacity uh, and also to double energy efficiency uh, by 2030. Uh, the European Union has also committed over uh, 20 billion to support sustainable energy projects in Africa, uh, 
uh, through the Africa EU Green Energy uh, Initiative. So I think uh, these, uh, um, these achievements um, that I, I mentioned, I think they clearly highlight the significant progress European Union has made in advancing uh, the green transition. Um, at your second uh, topic, the challenges we are facing in the green transition, I think um, one of the biggest issues um, European Union is facing, according to my view, is um, competitiveness. Competitiveness, especially when it comes to energy prices, uh, because, uh, yes, it's important to reduce CO2 emissions, it's critical, but we need to ensure that uh, energy remains accessible and affordable uh, to everyone. And uh, I think this balance is very essential um, when we want to talk about the success uh, of this transition. Uh, and uh, what we also see from a geopolitical uh, perspective, uh, we see that the global landscape is, um, is uh, shifting. Uh, before 2022, for example, Europe could rely uh, on, uh, on countries like Russia for, for energy, uh, but those foundations uh, we have witnessed that are now uh, shifting. Uh, so Europe has lost actually uh, a key energy supplier uh, and uh, it has lost its geopolitical uh, stability. And this made Europe, we have to admit that, weaker during the crisis. Uh, so we need to focus now, uh, through the lessons that have been learned, on, um, on improving productivity uh, if we want to drive growth uh, further. Uh, and I think uh, if we don't, uh, we will face tough uh, choices. Uh, because we won't be able to lead in new technologies, uh, we won't be able to be a climate role uh, model, and we won't be able to stay independent uh, on the global stage uh, all at once. I think India is also facing the same uh, uh, challenges, uh, primarily competing with uh, China uh, or um, US. Um, but I think we will discuss about that. Um, and um, uh, what I would also like to say is that uh, there is also a lot of um, volatility and unpredictability uh, within, uh, again, speaking about uh, uh, challenges. Uh, and this makes things difficult, uh, often for businesses, but also for consumers, uh, uh, I, would, uh, I would add. Um, to give you an example, I think in Europe, in Europe and that was in uh, Marius Draghi's, I think, report, um, electricity prices for uh, industries are two to three times uh, higher than in the United States and, uh, and uh, China. Um, gas prices, again, they are three to five times higher. Um, and we all understand that this has obviously a ripple effect across the economy, so making everything more expensive, uh, and reducing overall investments. Um, and of course, the energy, price, uh, the, crisis, the energy crisis has made it uh, even uh, uh, worse. Uh, there are several reasons uh, for this. I think uh, we had a, a slow infrastructure development um, in the last years. Um, and that's because we all understand that investments in uh, renewable energy, investments in grid infrastructure, uh, they are slow. It takes years sometimes to, um, to mobilize, no, to accelerate uh, the investments uh, uh, in grids. Market rules as well. Um, the way the electricity market works in, uh, in Europe, it doesn't always allow consumers uh, to fully benefit from cheaper, for example, renewable energy. Um, one additional route causes uh, also grid bottlenecks. Um, and sometimes, uh, I will add, we have a lack of uh, pan-European uh, uh, planning. Um, so, uh, my last word is on uh, where Greece stands. 
uh, Greece has managed to reduce uh, its emissions, uh, I would say more than any other European uh, Union country compared to 2005 uh, level, uh, approximately 43%. Uh, so I think we have achieved the greatest progress in Europe. Um, as uh, you probably have read, uh, Greece uh, has made also an impressive progress in renewables uh, in the past year. Uh, I was seeing today a new diagram that was uh, uh, mentioning, it was saying that Greece was ranked second uh, in the world in electricity generation coming from uh, wind and solar, second in the world for a small country. Uh, so currently we have over 50% uh, of our electricity that comes from renewables and that was a, a progress, a significant progress that was made in the past um, five years. And having reached this milestone, I think we are in a position now to set the bar uh, higher and increasing our ambition. And this is what we, we do. Uh, we have a, an excellent potential in wind and solar in Greece. Um, we aim, uh, we have today 12 gigawatt of installed capacity and we aim to add another 10 to 12 uh, in the next years. Uh, offshore wind is also a key part uh, of our plan. We have a target of 1.9 gigawatt by uh, 2030 and 12 gigawatt by 2050. Um, energy storage as well is very important for us and now it's, um, it's a priority. Um, and uh, transport, uh, building heating, energy efficiency in, uh, in buildings as well. Um, and of course, uh, I think um, we need to adopt more technologies this is, I think, uh, where we should uh, make a more um, effort. Um, again, I think uh, there is a huge opportunity between uh, Greece and India in this sector. Uh, there are so many um, challenges I think we both um, uh, face. Um, and uh, for me, collaboration with, uh, with India is uh, critical because, um, as I've seen, uh, India is targeting uh, 500 uh, gigawatt of uh, non-fossil fuels by uh, 2030. It's uh, an amazing number uh, for me. Uh, so it's definitely becoming a key player in, in the global energy transition. Um, and investments from both sides um, Indian companies investing in Europe, European companies investing in India. Uh, I think they're very, they're vital for securing funds, but also uh, exchanging the technical know-how, uh, which is again very important. And uh, finally, um, we had the chance, uh, some to discuss it uh, outside, uh, Indian's leadership in um, uh, IT technology. Um, we were talking about artificial intelligence, so I think this opens um, up uh, valuable opportunities uh, for collaboration in digital software solutions that can modernize even the energy systems. Uh, and uh, I think with that in mind, uh, uh, if we continue um, bonding ourselves and uh, creating uh, tangible uh, projects, uh, we will be in a position, both regions, to, to benefit uh, from more efficient and more advanced uh, energy infrastructure, and not only, that all of them support the green transition. I think I've said a lot of things, so I put a pause here. Thank you very much for listening to me. So, so thank you, Honorable Minister. I think you have set this stage for discussion to follow. I think my key takeaways, the seeds have been planted. Now aim is to water it well, give fertilizers, nurture it well, and make it into a big healthy tree. And despite the Russian invasion of Ukraine appending the fundamental security and energy architecture, the, the progress made by Greece has been very, very impressive to say the least. So I think your ministry deserves a round of applause for doing the amazing leadership, I think.
You can see the loud clapping despite the few people here. And so I think Greece's uh, statistics speak for themselves. Greece has achieved the biggest progress among EU is probably the leader in the world on, on this transition. And in EU, Greece is the leader. And, and despite being a country of your size, if you are the second largest in the world in renewable energy generation, that speaks of the amazing work being done. So all I can say is best of luck. Keep the amazing work. And your thing of making a energy affordable and accessible. So that touched the raw code and I will ta definitely take you up on the just transition in, in the Q&A. Sure. So maybe you can yeah. kind of we'll elaborate yeah, later. Yeah. And, and competitiveness, ma'am, I have only one problem to add. And as Ambassador Vadva would agree, the world has a China problem. EU has a China problem. India has a China problem. So everybody has a China problem. And Greece has a China problem. So, so that is, so this is not unique on competitiveness. <laughs> It's a problem which economic models, I mean, you're a lawyer, the, those who have studied economics, there is no economic solutions. I mean, it's not a kind of a classic free market economy. So it's like state plus private sector together competing with private sector. So it's very, very different. And I think finally, thank you for the word of optimism. I think India and Greece have much to offer to each other, particularly in terms of, uh, I mean, India definitely can, we can give you a few million people and we can give you skilled, skilled people, <laughs> AI workers, and then lots of technology the latest state of the art technology. Uh, I mean, we have uh, edge in some of the foundational technologies and we'd be happy to share mm -hmm. that with, I mean, there are a lot of knowledgeable people sitting in the audience. So maybe once we finish, we'll, we'll ask people for, you know, I mean, I'm definitely feeling much inadequate with a whole lot of experts sitting in the audience. Uh, you promise you will teach me artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows it. So you, like we were discussing off stage, she said, look, I don't know too much understand. I said, I spend a lot of time in the Silicon Valley not many people understand that. And those who are honest enough to admit that. Oh, so Bernard, we'll come to you next. Thank so you thank you much. for waiting patiently. You're the founder and CEO of Sparring Partner Switzerland. Uh, so I assume you don't understand too much of India, too much of a um, <laughs> little bit more of Greece, but probably you definitely understand Europe better. You understand the world better. And I, uh, during, well, while we were preparing for this, I mean, I will read out from what you sent in the mail to me. He says the numerous initiatives to achieve the UN social development goals are in the danger of not being achieved. Globally considered measures are needed, regulations as well as incentives for companies and individuals alike to avert the impending climate collapse. And you quoted, uh, specifically pointed out that BlackRock's pulling out, uh, pulling away from the admittedly controversial ESG principles and I, we don't understand fully, you know, what happened, Texas State and you know, all, all the politics there despite spending a lot of time in the US. Uh, so. With BlackRock pulling out from this controversial, uh, admittedly controversial ESG principles, this is a devastating sign. It's probably a little bit of a, I would say, it, it kind of Warning puts sign. us back in the fight against transition to ESG. Pranjal has written a beautiful book, The Next New, which is, talks about fifth industrial revolution and then talks a lot about the ESG. So it would be good to hear your thoughts on these and, and you can take about four to five minutes. So we are yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, you can sit there, you can go there, yeah, up no, to you. Fine. Thank you very much, uh, Sam, Her Excellency. Uh, very interesting to listen to your remarks. Uh, uh, esteemed co-panelists, I'm very um, proud and feel very honored to be on this panel. Also, I was planned to uh, be on this early morning panel at 8 o'clock uh, on Gen C, um, which I am, for me, as an educated sociologist, would have been much more easy. I have to be honest, I cannot contribute nothing in particular when it comes to the right um, alternative energy system, neither for um, Greece or uh, India. But uh, what, I can, what I can say is, from a global scale, that we are facing um, a huge transformation, and um, as a reputation management expert, we advise companies in change management. Um, I think it's very crucial to say, and Her Excellency mentioned the point, in order to make people contribute to this transformation, they have to see the benefits uh, for them. Uh, where, what is in there for me uh, to really make this paradigm shift towards a um, low carbon economy and uh, I think we are far away from reaching um, the SDG, the social um, um, development goals. Um, and uh, I was participating last week precisely um, in the Liechtenstein Sustainable Finance Conference, which I um, moderated twice uh, with her, His Excellence 
um, the, the Prince Max of Liechtenstein. So the, the third thing is, um, having looked at this development over the last five years, I have to admit there is not, not, not a lot of progress been made. Uh, unfortunately, in the contrary, uh, we can see that the 2050 goals will not be um, achieved, not accomplished, and, um, and I think there are a couple of reasons. Um, but the good thing is um, that we have this, this kind of dialogue, and I think very much important to, um, to, as we as advisors, consultants, we look at the company, at all stakeholders, um, and these are inside a company and outside, and all the critical ones, and I, I really think it's very important to to make progress, like Greece is doing, uh, for instance, um, to involve all stakeholders in this process. And this means cross-border, um, uh, looking at what is happening in the world, um, and looking, for instance, in Switzerland, we are contributing to, um, to watering the seeds which have been planted. It's raining at this moment in Switzerland. <laughs> um, but looking at this, people, the biggest problem is not um, the environment or the climate, but they're looking at uh, immigration, they're looking at um, um, the pension funds, they're looking at rising costs. So we see that um, the environmental issue was top of mind, uh, let's say like five years ago, but now that has changed. And then we're facing geopolitical crisis in Ukraine and in, in Israel, and all of a sudden, this, this important topic of um, low carbon um, growth is not top of mind anymore, and this is a tragedy. And on top of that, companies and countries are more and more divided, so everybody looks for him or herself, and what the world needs is a, a common sense and a common action. Uh, it's uh, not divide, but um, let's stick together and work together. So. I, I think we need a little bit more dose of optimism from and maybe energy from Greece <laughs> to water those plants, you know. And then I think Greece has to play a greater leadership role, I think, in the EU for, you know, taking meeting meeting our aspirations for transition to low carbon economy. We, we are doing this. Um, I think uh, if you want to have... Uh, now we have to think uh, not uh, locally, each of us, because the challenges are common for, uh, for all of us. Uh, so the mindset should change. And uh, I think what we have managed in the last five years, and especially our Greek prime minister, is um, um, to become um, an opinion maker, I would say, within the uh, European Union. Um, and um, it, it's good to see that this cooperation among member states uh, has become more and more effective. Yeah. So next, you move, we move to you, Professor Dr. Kobe Kunduri. You, you are the you are the chair, World Council of Environmental and Natural Resource e Economists Association, chair of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, uh, and. So you're, you're, you develop national and regional pathways, and, and you make a lot of policies, technologies, you provide financial and fiscal instruments, and, and you provide a lot of guidance for transition to climate neutrality and resilience. Uh, you use holistic and interdisciplinary methodology, and so we would like you to educate us more on the work being done by you, and how do you kind of co-design with all the other stakeholders the pathways for low carbon economy, and, and how far we have come in the journey. A lot of questions, but all yours, you can take five minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I can take five minutes. Let me know when I'm done. No, no I, worries. I, I, We're I, okay for time. Okay. So, I'm an economist. I'm a mathematical economist. Uh, now, I'm a professor between the Athens University of Economics and Business and the Technical University of Denmark, DTU, and I spent 18 years in, in Cambridge before I came to Greece. Since the 19... In 1995, I was one of the very few economists that was always applying its research on the issue of climate change. So the issue of climate change is not new in the research agenda, and the issue of sustainability has been on the political agenda since the 1970s. However, it's only recently 
that we see global initiatives on this theme. So it is quite efficient to uh, think back uh, in uh, 2015, September, New York, we have the 17 Sustainable Development Goals signed by 163 countries. 17 goals, four about the environment, eight about uh, the society, another four about the economy, and one about collaboration. And why I always start from there? Because it is now the only global agenda, in addition to the Charter of Human Rights. And because this framework has the correct ingredients, it's holistic, it's interdisciplinary, <clears throat> and it's the right way to go in terms of designing the transformation we need. I think we all agree that we need a transformation. Where we are now, we are facing economic challenges, slow growth, inflationary pressures, shrinking fiscal spaces, one third of the countries in the world at the brink of default. And in addition to these social and economic challenges, together with population growth uh, in certain parts of the world and aging population in others. And together with this, we are facing serious challenges on climate crisis and the biodiversity collapse, which are serious because they are effects transposed into millions and trillions of dollars of lost infrastructure and disruption of economic activity every year, not to add the loss of life and also collapse of the ecosystems of the environment on which our consumption and production depends. So all these multi-crises can be in a way escaped if we um, build pathways away from where we are today to sustainability. And sustainability is very well articulated in these 17 goals and 169 targets within the SDGs. Every year, as Sustainable Development Solutions Network, this is uh, a network of 2,000 universities across the world that is under the auspices of the General Secretary of the UN, publishes a report that showcases where each country stands with regards to each of the goals and with regards to each of the targets within the goals. Now, given that we more or less know with a very quantified way where each country stands, and we also know where we want to go because these SDGs have been uh, transposed into regional political frameworks. The best one, the leadership one, is as uh, the minister said, the European Green Deal, some also um, uh, referred to this. The European Green Deal is the best, best example we have of a very holistic policy framework that cares about the environment, climate change, and biodiversity collapse, and nature, and the, um, and the use of land, and the use of energy, and health systems, and also socioeconomic systems. And these kind of attempts are also happening in other regions of the world. Not so well scientifically based, maybe, but they are happening. So what we are having now is that all regions of the world are trying to move to sustainability. And how do you move to sustainability? Let me very quickly close by a very um, uh, uh, as simple as possible description of the world that my team does at the UN Sustainable Development Network Global Climate Hub. This hub is there to build 
transition pathways to climate neutrality and climate resilience for each and every country in the world. We are working in 120 countries. It has three layers. The first layer is a system science integration of climate models, energy models, transport models, land use models, marine use models, health system models, and socioeconomic models. And these models try to identify the optimal mixture of technologies, policies, fiscal and financial instruments that you need in each of these systems in order to move from where we are. And as I told you, we measure every year, we quantify every year as well as possible where we are with respect to the SDGs and trying to move 2030, which is the first deadline for the SDGs, and then beyond 2015, which I hope in New York next week it will be identified as the next deadline for the SDGs. And after this science-based layer, we also have at a simultaneous mode the stakeholder engagement layer. Nothing will happen if we scientists produce solutions. What will change the world is our ability to engage all other stakeholders in this science-based dialogue. Offer the solutions in a way that can be understood and further discuss and co-design with all other stakeholders, the politicians, the policy makers, the businesses, the financial institutions, the civil society, in order to produce a pathway that is readily implementable. And for that, you need all stakeholders to become shareholders of the solutions and the profit of these solutions pathways. It is crucial that the finances are there. And in order to get the finances there, and I'm going to get back to this, I hope, in my uh, second statement, you need to make sure that you pick the pathways that can provide, yes, the correct sustainable interaction between nature and society, but at, this, uh, at the same time, they are financially profitable. And it is uh, through very detailed investigation of the opportunities and the layers of mixing the solutions that you can identify the financially sustainable opportunities. And not only that, you also need to worry about the global south. So it's not enough for Europe to become climate neutral or climate resilient or biodiversity resilient. It's not enough. It's a global problem. It's not enough for the Inflationary Act to achieve that in the US. It is crucial to have China and India on board and Europe and the US and at the same time the global south. This calls for a serious First, identification of sustainable finance and sustainable fiscal solutions in the developed world, because even developed countries face very big challenges in terms of the affordability, especially to the vulnerable layers of the socioeconomic systems of the pathway towards renewable, towards circular economy, towards nature-based solutions, towards digitalization, due, towards mobility. But at the same time, you need to restructure global financial architecture in order to be able to streamline serious finance in SDG based stimulus in the global south, so that everybody can engage. Your, your passion and enthusiasm is <laughs> infectious. So I think she deserves a big round of applause. I, I think I understood about 70% of what you said, but I think even if we implement 50%, I think the battle would have been won. And as a member of Global South, as a humble member of Global South, uh, I feel that, you know, and India has always sought differentiated responsibilities. So as it looks from India looking westwards, 
These are the people who polluted it. They, they created the big problem. So they should do a little more heavy lifting, put a little bit more finances. They're richer. They got there. You know, we still have to spoil the environment to get there to become rich. So, so I think the leadership is very, very inspiring. I think what Europe is doing, what Greece is doing, is a step in the correct direction. I, I hope the US kind of doesn't move away after 5th of November from, from its commitments. And uh, we hope India and China will also do their bit, along with other members of Global South. So, Akai-san, yes. so thank you for waiting so patiently. Uh, and no, I will, no, no, I mean, yeah. And I will pick up from where yeah, she left. Exactly, um, and already mentioned. Um, OK, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So I will just kind of, I want you to pick up some of the exactly. very basic things yes, in your, yes, yes. I mean, how do you use this animal waste, you know, biomass, all those, the farm waste, all those yes. things, and how do you kind of um, make magic out of it? How do you kind of take small community-based yes. initiatives? And then exactly. how do you protect nature against over-exploitation, I think, you know, given your background, I think yeah, you'd yeah. be the best to comment I'm on it. To, yeah, so and one more thing I wanted to before oh, I allow you. I'll give you five minutes, don't worry. Um, you have a lot of experience of India, Greece, yes, Japan, yes. you know, all the best practices. And Japanese are known for, <laughs> since childhood, they are taught yeah. to be clean. Who, I mean, everybody remembers, I hope, the World Cup after which they lost in, in, in Moscow and thereafter they cleaned up the whole stadium and then they went. Or when a big earthquake struck, you know, and big tsunami, yeah. people are still standing in the queue. So there's lots to learn from where you come from. Yes. So all yours, your five minutes, and some we will take in the Q&A. So thank you very much. And, uh, uh, you know, many important uh, points uh, already mentioned. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, there are several uh, important keywords, like sustainability and the renewable energies. And like, you know, typically, uh, the uh, minister mentioned, like, uh, solar and uh, windmills and hydro uh, may uh, very uh, favorite renewable energies and I'm not very much against uh, about it and uh, there are uh, people need especially uh, country like India are growing very much rapidly and are still uh, very much uh, have a chance to grow more and I need more energy and it means yes I uh, need some more development and that's I'm not very much against about it, but uh, at the same time, uh, I'm thinking about uh, some balance, and uh, we need to uh, look at uh, over-exploitation, like, uh, you know, the, like cutting uh, woods and trees from the uh, mountains, and that is a really obviously, um, you know, the exploitation of the nature, and a country like Greece, it is a very beautiful uh, country with nature, and I, as I mentioned earlier, I have experience uh, working with Thessaloniki University about livestock industry, and uh, uh, that's uh, such a, a beautiful, nice place, and uh, nice people over there, and uh, we had uh, like uh, 10 years working experience uh, with Thessaloniki University, with a uh, dairy, uh, and also swine industry. About uh, topic was uh, probiotics, it is a microbiology, and uh, animal feed. Uh, we have uh, uh, our company have uh, some uh, uh, EU approval uh, about the product, and we had a long, like a long uh, experience uh, working with Thessaloniki University, doing a lot of uh, animal uh, researches, and uh, uh, you know there's a really you know I really um, learned how uh, the cross. Uh, closely working, family and uh, communities and in Greece, and uh, that is a very uh, beautiful thing. And uh, like a uh, very old fashioned Japanese style was the uh, same, and we uh, really valued uh, family and uh, our neighbors. And uh, uh, that's, I'm thinking the same values uh, Greek people are uh, sharing with, and uh, that's I'm very much uh, you know, appreciating and uh, very much respecting. Uh, Greek style of, uh, how to say, local community and uh, uh, families. And at the same time, as I mentioned, India, uh, you know, the, uh, religiously, it is a huge experience, I mean, the uh, influence on Japan uh, from the Buddhist uh, influence. And uh, uh, Japan and India have the same very beautiful uh, values having, like it is uh, respecting elders, that are respecting uh, peoples and uh, uh, you know, uh, not too much uh, about uh, uh, exploitation, but uh, living small and uh, respecting uh, each other. That's uh, uh, such a big, big influence. And having said all of this, uh, thinking about uh, sustainability and uh, renewable energies, 
Uh, my area is, uh, as I said, biotechnologies. That is uh, our livestock and uh, using uh, animal waste to create uh, energies. And uh, anyway, one way or another, uh, growing uh, dairies, uh, you know, it is a uh, animal waste. It is uh, already the environmental problem okay. because of the smell. And uh, uh, mm -hmm. people are really having a bad, uh, how to say, uh, you know, the impact from the smell growing uh, dairy uh, cows. But uh, as I said, um, you know, dairies industry is very important uh, Greek and uh, of course in India because of the like milk and the yogurt. And the Greek yogurt is the uh, one thing I really thought maybe very good uh, collaboration could be uh, done between India and the Greek and uh, maybe growing some new industry or maybe very good cooperation, synergy uh, having because Greek uh, yogurt have uh, such a very good brand image especially maybe in only in Japan, but uh, we like Greek yogurt a lot. And uh, maybe uh, creating a national brand of Greek yo uh, yogurt and uh, doing some export industry uh, for the yogurt could be uh, one good example uh, uh, thinking about uh, um, the renewable energies, biomass energy, and primary industries, uh, you know, the, it is really uh, one forgotten area usually because agriculture is a, such a very difficult uh, industry and uh, IT is or uh, service area is uh, the more uh, younger generation uh, really fond of and uh, people want to do more for like uh, IT is or uh, service industries rather than uh, very hard working of uh, primary industry like uh, livestock. And uh, but, uh, one thing is, uh, you know, because of the uh, wages, you know, the from primary industry uh, earnings are, are relatively very small compared with like service industry and uh, like uh, information technologies, and uh, it is uh, really uh, people are earning millions of uh, euros or dollars. But the uh, primary industries, uh, you know, very hard, and the uh, earnings are relatively small. However, as I mentioned, if it connect to like. Uh, yogurt industry or food industry and ex especially export could be creating a new uh, you know, source of uh, wages uh, for the primary industries. So like uh, we are already doing in Japan because Japan have a uh, same uh, problem because younger generation uh, really stay away from primary industry like uh, livestock, like dairy industry. And the dairy industry in Japan is really dying and uh, it used to, it was a big uh, market and uh, it was a really good business. However, now people are stay away because no more younger generation is working in uh, daily industry. And instead, uh, people are buying milk from abroad and uh, especially from New Zealand or Australia is a, a, a milk source for Japanese uh, milk. However, uh, you know, we really have to keep uh, the primary industry as a nation, as a country, uh, as a Japan. So uh, we are, our company is doing some challenge in the uh, daily area. It is a north uh, town in uh, uh, Hokkaido, is maybe some of them are north. We are tr uh, trying to do uh, connecting this bio, uh, biomass <coughs> and also uh, new energy projects with daily industries. And uh, uh, maybe we can do, we, we have some showroom, so maybe uh, uh, we, uh, we are happy, uh, Minister, you can instruct Ambassador, uh, Greek Ambassador in Japan to visit our uh, test plant. Then we can run together, because it is uh, such a long-term challenge, and it is a small uh, challenge, but we are looking at a very long-term future, and maybe we can create together uh, some uh, local uh, base and uh, it is uh, appreciating the nature, mm -hmm. and uh, at the same time creating new jobs and a uh, new industry. That's what I'm thinking at the moment uh, in terms of synergy between India and uh, Greece. So, so I think, yeah, thank So I think, I think, I think Madam Minister has yeah. got two, I think, buy, buy one, get one free. You know, take <laughs> India, get Japan uh, free. Yeah, yeah, India yeah, and Japan are great yeah. friends. So I think, I'm very happy so with you. I think, ma'am, will take that offer. Uh, so we are doing okay for time. I think we are, oh, yes. we are on track. So we now move to Q&A questions and I want to keep about 10 to 15 minutes for audience because there are a lot of knowledgeable people in the audience and 
We definitely want to get their thoughts. Wisdom is not our sole prerogative, so sitting on this stage, yeah. So, so ma'am, in your view, what steps can, you, you, we talked about the world has a China problem, EU has a China problem, competitiveness. In your you know, opinion, what steps can EU take to enhance the competitiveness and accelerate the adoption of clean tech solutions, as you highlighted in your opening remarks? And maybe if I can put a second question and you can take in whichever order you want. And, and how can we ensure a just transition that you're so mm. passionately making it affordable, accessible to all? So which on, on our way to reaching climate neutrality. So all of Difficult, all difficult uh, issues both. Um, now, regarding competitiveness, uh, I think we must admit uh, that we, we, in Europe, we've been too slow, okay? And uh, China, on the other side, and the US have moved ahead uh, quickly. Um, whether we like it or not, China now is um, leading, especially the global clean tech market. Uh, and I would say they're leading because f for five actually key uh, reasons, to explain it simply. First, um, they innovate quickly. Uh, second, um, they keep uh, manufacturing costs low, which is uh, again important. Third, uh, I would add they, uh, they control their entire supply chain from uh, raw materials to shipping. Uh, it's also important for us that the government provides uh, subsidies. Um, and uh, what is always important on behalf of the investor side is that the, um, the, the permits, the approval processes, they're fast. Um, and I think that these factors, um, they create um, the perfect environment. So I think there are some good things to learn from China? Exactly. Okay. Why, this is why I'm saying, this is, I think, for me, the perfect environment for uh, uh, supply chains and companies that want to grow, accelerate uh, the green transition, and at the same time increase uh, competitiveness. Uh, and unfortunately, these elements, uh, the same critical elements, uh, I think Europe uh, lacks to, to boost this uh, competitiveness in clean tech uh, uh, for these reasons, for, for the reasons I mentioned. And we see the results, for example, over 60% today of the global manufacturing capacity uh, for key value chain material uh, of uh, batteries, uh, solar, whatever, um, is located uh, in, uh, in China. Um, and at the same time, um, the European Union uh, shows um, a, a deindustrialization uh, um, image. Uh, I think it's not only, and it's not only China, because I don't want to hear uh, try to sound like uh, Donald Trump. Um, I don't have anything personal against uh, uh, China. I think this is simply the reality we face, uh, and uh, we need to catch up if uh, we want to stay competitive. Uh, I can also mention, uh, obviously, the United States, uh, which is also progressing very fast uh, because of their focus, again, on these five key pillars. Uh, I mentioned, uh, I remember the talks during the past two years, two, three years, uh, with, uh, for the IRA uh, of, uh, of the states. Uh, the United States, they have invested uh, around, uh, if I remember well, three, uh, 360 something, 370 billion uh, uh, dollars in, uh, in clean energy. Uh, and obviously, this helps uh, US companies to build uh, solar panels, uh, uh, batteries, um, EVs, uh, everything, uh, making them less dependent. Uh, so the million dollar question is uh, what we can do in Europe. Uh, um, and, and if I can just before that just add one thing. Uh, the US policy, I mean, US was the Mecca of free capital and you know, no, no tariffs, another thing, you know, absolute yes. free trade. 
but some of the US policies may be confusing the allies itself. It's not only directed at China, but sometimes it even puts trusted friends like Greece and EU at a disadvantage. Correct. Uh, I, I don't believe, I think, in a, in a simple uh, black and white uh, solutions, especially uh, when we talk about Europe's complex uh, context, because uh, it is a little bit more complicated with uh, uh, European uh, uh, rules. But I think uh, um, uh, we need a smarter and a more balanced, uh, I would say, uh, strategy. Uh, and um, what does this include? Um, again, if we see again these five topics I mentioned, first we must simplify um, streamline regulations, uh, approval processes, make them, um, especially for infrastructure projects, especially for uh, clean tech projects, make, make them easier. Um, I think uh, one of the biggest challenges within European Union is how long it takes in order to get these projects uh, off the ground. Um, and uh, I think this is what the market actually is asking for. Uh, more, uh, more than 60%, I would say, from uh, European Union companies, when they're, you're asking them, they say that regulation is an obstacle to, to invest. Um, and also, if we look smaller companies, 50, 55, I think, percent of uh, uh, small, medium companies, again, they flag uh, regulatory and administratively, administrative uh, obstacles as their greatest uh, challenge. Uh, and here we need to take the necessary steps uh, in order to reduce the time, uh, the time that is required for companies to, um, to access funds as well. Uh, we need to provide incentives, we need to shorten uh, the time to market, and uh, as I mentioned, we need to speed up the, the permitting uh, procedures. Um, the bureaucrats and the bankers need to become faster. <laughs> and the uh, judicial process. And judicial, okay. Like, and judicial, yeah. Uh, I think it's um, what Mario Draghi uh, mentioned in his report, that Europe needs to make it easier uh, for investors to become investors. I think there's a lot of excitement about Mario Draghi coming in, even outside Europe. Uh, it's fresh, it's yeah. quite fresh, uh, a few days ago, but I think uh, we should uh, take this outcome uh, quite seriously and see what we can uh, uh, make it better and how we can uh, progress. Uh, so, uh, again, within Europe, if uh, we want to achieve this uh, competitiveness <coughs> and uh, of course, if we want to achieve these green transition goals, uh, we will need, according to, to the figures so fast, uh, around um, uh, 600 to 800 billion per year for the green transition uh, uh, goals. And uh, again, here I think um, find a way to provide uh, uh, financial support and incentives uh, for these investments is very crucial. Uh, so, so you'll have to mobilize all kinds of things from, I mean, from World Bank, from Europe, exactly. from, you know, Greece, from private sector, maybe. I, I, I think it's an opportunity here to, to mingle. Uh, uh, blend the funds. Yes, blend the funds, exactly. Yes. Uh, and um, find a way to expedite more the processes. Okay. No, maybe he wants to add in something. But you, either you can speak loud or you can yep. just go take the mic. Pranjal, is there a mic, roving mic? Kind of, he's author of a book on this and <laughs> educates people we across the world. Pranjal, to, yeah, to he, he, he probably, in his latest book, he has covered a lot about it. The next really? week, he moderates sessions at World Economic Forum on the... Uh, Minister, uh, I'm glad you mentioned this, and of course, uh, Mario Draghi's report is very, very fascinating. It's creating a, a lot of debate, I know, in Europe also, too, talked about the competitiveness. But you mentioned, uh, you mentioned money. I'm Pranjal Sharma. I'm an author and columnist and economic analyst based in New Delhi. A couple of numbers. During COVID, more than, you know, the estimate of 10 to $12 trillion of support were generated by various governments across the world, trillion dollars. I'm talking about 10 to 12 uh, 
Um, even last year, the subsidy given for energy uh, for fossil fuels was over $7 trillion. Um, and now we are struggling to find $500 mil billion for climate funding. So my question then is that why, what is the challenge in finding money when you could find, you mean, you know, the global governments could find trillions of dollars just like that um, for other interests and even now we are subsidizing fossil fuels. Why are we struggling to find money for, for climate uh, change? Uh, and second point uh, related is behavior change. Now 12% of the global north population is actually polluting the world at a much higher per capita than the uh, rest of the 80%. And I'm, I would request, uh, uh, you know, other panelists, it's not just about what Minister is saying, and I think the entire hall should look at these questions. We don't see that behavior change happening at a societal consumer level, because ultimately that's going to drive uh, change. So I, I want to just mention those figures as a comparison and say that can we therefore look at being positive or do we still have to remain a little bit pragmatic and practical and realize that some of these goals are not going to be met anytime soon? <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I, like your, I like your question. I think uh, we should combine uh, optimism and at the same time we have to be realistic pragmatic, and yeah. pragmatic, right? Uh, but let me give you an example about when you're asking about um, why we struggle for, uh, for money. Uh, it's true that after COVID, let's say, European Union mobilized a lot of, uh, a lot of money to help us accelerate the, with the green transition. And uh, thanks to these financial tools, we were in a position as Greece for the very first time to, uh, to take uh, 30 billion um, for, uh, for the recovery plan uh, in Greece, and 30% uh, of this money were allocated for uh, green investments. And um, uh, we are really grateful for that to the European Union because thanks to this budget, uh, in these three, four years, uh, we have managed to do this, to make this progress that I mentioned in the renewables, in the energy efficiency, blah, blah, so many pillars. One day we had a, a very heavy uh, rainfall, as you know, it was last year. And uh, just one day, a couple of hours actually, were enough to, um, they were enough, yes, in order to create a, a disaster um, for climate reasons, obviously. And why I'm saying this? because the reconstruction of uh, a small area in Greece to rebuild it and to allocate new money from the beginning for the agriculture, for the infrastructure, for everything, uh, was around five billion. So uh, can you imagine uh, as there are more and more, you know, these uh, phenomena coming extreme from uh, extreme, exactly, from uh, fires and floods, how can we find the necessary funding in order to achieve at the same time the carbon neutrality goals and uh, at the same time uh, make the necessary investments uh, in order to have more resilient uh, infrastructure? That's why uh, we are struggling, let's say, for, for more funding because um, we, can, we won't be in a position uh, to work in parallel uh, meeting the goals. I mean, how can I say to people, change your cars, your combustion engine cars with uh, electric ones, when uh, uh, people, they suffer from uh, floods and they need to make their houses from the, the beginning. Uh, so that's for us a very critical uh, issue, I think. And anyone wants to add anything? Yes, uh, I mean, it, it's both mitigation and adaptation. Yeah. And they have, need to happen together. <clears throat> and they need to be made available at an affordable price for the different layers of income. It is true, there are 
lots of money in the world. It's about, however, having the institutions to streamline the money to SDG-based or you know, green and digital, um, sustainable cons uh, consumption and production uh, goals. So we all know that the public money, all the public money in the world are not enough for supporting the transition to sustainability. So it is obvious that we need the private sector and we need blended finance, but the private sector in order to come in has to be explicit that the whole process is efficient, like the minister was saying. We need to have a swift processes for getting the approvals, for implementing the, pro the project, for having a very efficient litigation progress, for reducing the cost of labor, for having the expertise within the countries, within the regions to implement the new technologies. So I totally agree that the money is there. I also agree that the technology is almost there at least for most sectors, include, excluding some, aviation, shipping, um, still, but we are getting there. What we need now is to get the right efficiency in the system, uh, the, in the collaboration between the public and the private uh, money and also the public and the private system in order to unite towards identifying where are the competitive advantages of each country in order to uh, promote the solutions. Behavior, huge issue because up to now we've been talking about the supply side. The demand side is what will articulate what the supply side will at the end of the day do. Because the business man wants to make sure that it has the demand side there in order to appraise the project. So we need a lot of incentives, we need a lot of education, we need a lot of upskilling and reskilling. And I have lots to say, but I don't want to monopolize, I just want to say one thing. Last COP, we presented a report on the skills and occupations that are needed to implement in Europe the already voted for and transposed into national policies in the 27 countries, laws and regulations and directive of the European Green Deal. And these have to be implemented by 2030 first wave and 2050 second wave. 85 percent of the skills and occupations we need are not yet in the labor force in the whole of Europe. So to implement what? The businessman puts the money in, brings the technology in. The government puts the money in, brings the technology in. Do we have the labor force ready to really engage in this? Not yet. I think we'll kind of, we'll just yeah. take a, uh, you do you want to, yeah, uh, I, maybe a minute for you and then we'll take yeah, a quick no, question. Yeah, no, of course, it's a minute. Uh, or, or do you want to take the question and then yeah, we'll no. take Yeah, no, so, yeah. So, quick comment. Anyone else wants to put anything after that? So, just please show off and uh, Ambassador Vadva, would you like to add anything? No, thank you. So, excellent, yeah, please. Excellent panel. Thank you so much. Follow-up, uh, actually, to the point Mr. Bauhofer made that uh, it seems on the public sector side, the interest in energy transition and sustainability has peaked. And obviously you're just mentioning in order to deliver to the net zero 2050 you know, roadmaps to the energy transition, we need public and private collaboration. So I'd like to ask you know, from your public sector angle, do you also feel that the interest has peaked similar to you know, the observation from the private sector? And especially since on the public sector, we're going through elections every four years. I think it's a very good point. Um, we're talking about a huge sum of money. It was 9.6 trillion US dollars a year to reallocate financial streams from um, fossil uh, industries to um, low carbon uh, growth, as uh, the topic is of this today. Uh, I think it's enormous uh, money, and, and most of the money, if I get it right, is from the taxpayers, public initiatives. 
Uh, we're not talking about the big elephant, which is invisible in this room, is uh, the black rocks, right? And um, I was shocked to see it one day when I looked at Bloomberg, and there was a small notice on the right banner saying that uh, black rocks is saying he will reallocate its investments on behalf of um, the investors uh, from ESG investments to so-called quality investments. What, what are quality investments? Uh, they are they're putting in money into arms, uh, they're putting money into pharmaceutical business and other so-called traditional businesses, which definitely not help um, to achieve um, the SDGs. So what we need is a, a public-private partnership, that's for sure, but how you get those big um, black rocks, and not only black rocks only, to change their strategy. And we talked about sanctions, we talked about incentives. In the very end, it's the consumer, it's the investor who has to be educated. And I think what we're seeing here is it's enormous potential of uh, reducing the complexity of what we're hearing, and complexity is increasing. And how do you communicate this to the people in order to be part of this um, transformation and understand what they have to do, and they have to put the money in a different, uh, different pocket. That's the point. So any other questions, remarks? Yeah, please, can you pass on the mic? Sorry, oh, you can. Uh, taste uh, and in Greece with renewable energy producing only Greek yogurt. What about that? <laughs> so, so I was on a, I was on, maybe I'll take this one. Only 5% for Japan, 9% for the people in so, uh, India. So I was on a panel on, on Cyprus and they said, you know, the, the panelists said, Cy Cyprus has 1 million people including me. So he counted <laughs> it. And, and then we said, look, um, Mumbai has got about 25 million and I had another panelist who was from Delhi NCR, National Capital Region, which is 34 million. He said, don't worry, we'll give you, you know, 1, 1 million each, no worries. All your labor <laughs> issues will be... So that was this, but ma'am, we'll come back to you on the just transition. This the is close to my heart. Um, yeah. Okay, I, I, I believe we can all agree that um, achieving a fair and uh, inclusive green transition uh, is crucial for every economy. Uh, and I'm sure that India as well as Greece, they face uh, this challenge. And why I'm saying this, because uh, it's, um, it's not uh, enough just to invest, as we are talking here, in new technologies and uh, change uh, the model of how we produce and how we consume energy. Uh, we must consider at the same time the needs uh, of all citizens, from uh, major cities to the most remote, um, areas and we must ensure that costs and benefits uh, are fairly uh, distributed. Uh, I think this is the most difficult uh, uh, task. Plus, I would add that um, citizens, you know, they need to feel personally involved um, and they need to see the benefits uh, of the transition. Otherwise, they are not yet convinced. We say that climate change is an existential uh, issue, uh, but still people, it's what you said, the, the, the mindset yet has not been fully changed uh, because we don't understand what we gain from this. Uh, and this is one of the responsibilities, I think, that uh, the state, but also the society has to, to make it a... Uh, uh, to, to understand, to make people understand. So in Greece, uh, what we are doing regarding the just transition is that we are implementing uh, the so-called just transition development plan. Uh, it's a very concrete master plan, uh, especially for those areas that are affected in Greece uh, by the phasing out of uh, fossil fuels. We have uh, big regions in Greece that for many, many years, 40, 50 years, they were living by this economic activity. And all of a sudden, one day, we announced that uh, we will uh, change it. Um, so um, what does this plan actually has? It, uh, it focuses on creating jobs, which is, I think, 
the most important, um, on supporting businesses and uh, also developing sectors like uh, uh, innovation, uh, manufacturing. Uh, so not only, you know, those areas, they were used by living uh, because of the fossil fuels activity. Uh, and this is um, uh, now as we are transforming the production model of those areas, uh, we need to enrich it with other sectors like smart agriculture, like uh, uh, digitalization, like in, in other sectors. So uh, from uh, what we have managed uh, for years now is that from uh, 2021 to 2027, uh, we will receive approximately uh, 1.6 billion uh, euros coming from the European Union Just Transition uh, Mechanism and Fund, uh, with a total of uh, 5 billion uh, coming from uh, both European and uh, national resources. So currently we have uh, 5 billion euros. Uh, it's on our hands to allocate them on a fair uh, way uh, to, to people who suffer. Uh, and at the same time, of course, from other private and uh, public funding uh, uh, sources, we are uh, pursuing uh, uh, projects such as the uh, decarbonization of our islands, uh, because in, in Greece we have a lot of uh, islands that still depend on... Very beautiful islands. Very beautiful, yeah. and we should transform them into... Uh, smart and green uh, uh, and uh, lastly this is another financial tool which is the social climate fund um, I don't know yet many information on that but I think uh, this is going to provide also to Greece another three three billion uh, something which yes. will be dedicated for vulnerable uh, people uh, so we I think we have the necessary funding it's on us to expedite the, the projects and uh, this master plan and uh, see the, the benefits of, uh, of, of this transition coming to the final, uh, to, the, uh, to the consumer or to the citizen. So the heart is in the right place. You're not yes. in for brutal capitalism, but for a very, very just kind of support to the society in transitioning. Absolutely. So I think we'll, Akai-san, yes. thank you again for passionately. You are a friend of India oh, and Greece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and maybe in, we've got, we're running a little out of time. We have about three minutes left, so I want to leave a little. <coughs> so can you just tell us what we can do together? I mean, yeah. And we will accept your verdict. Yeah, yeah, it was, I'm uh, <laughs> like, uh, you know, Japanese. So looking at uh, Greece and India from somewhere, you know, uh, from different angles. But I'm very, uh, you know, let's say the optimistic uh, about it, and uh, especially for Greece, uh, I think it is a quite a difficult uh, 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 consideration uh, required because thinking about Greece itself, but uh, thinking about the European Union at the same time, so uh, different, uh, difficult approach may be required, but as I said, because of this very beautiful nature and uh, such a big potential uh, with uh, hardworking people, so you know, I'm uh, together with uh, India, a uh, huge uh, investment and uh, hardworking people, and I'm really only looking at a very bright future uh, between uh, Greece and uh, India. That's so, so what I can say. Thank you. I think you were outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. I think a quick 30 seconds from you. Yeah, and the, uh, Very quickly, um, I act as an advisor to G20, and now, uh, of course, Europe has this uh, just transition that the minister said fund, the climate fund, uh, which is part of it for 55. Uh, countries that have fiscal space, and I refer to Europe as one country, let's say, it's, uh, it's not yet, but it, it, it's uh, functioning in a way that tries to help all others. Country is easier. The other big question, which is there in G20, and we are discussing now in New York at the summit for the future at UN level, is how we restructure the global financial architecture in order to allow financial flows 
to the global south because it is crucial for the global north as well. So we need multilateral banks and multilateral institutions to solve this huge issue now because as I said before, one third of the countries in the world are in the brink of default. So it is important to have SDG stimulus there and bring funds and expertise and knowledge and investments uh, to the global south from where uh, they exist. And it is crucial that we not just bring the funds and the investment, but we build the capacity, the education, the skills and knowledge in order to embrace all these investments. So thank you very much. I think we have had a fascinating conversation and uh, thank you esteemed panelists. And I will end by beginning, you will, I, I will end by where Madam began. You know, the seeds have been planted. It's now time to water to make it a healthy tree. So thank you very much, esteemed panelists. Thank you, sir. You were awesome. awesome. Very good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.